Welcome back to the Wood Offshore Europe podcast for 2023. I'm your host, Lisa Clark, and today I'm joined by Human Hagigi, Director of Decarbonisation Solutions, and James Hallbeach, Global Director of Production Optimization. In today's episode, um, we're going to discuss carbon capture and storage and the focus on industrial clusters and the shared infrastructure in the UK and you know how this could potentially set the UK up um, to lead the way in developing the CCS markets. Um, these clusters improve the commercial viability of CCS projects but come with their challenges as well around capturing and transporting CO2 um, from a cluster of different emitters. Um, so I know today's experts have got a lot of rich insights um, around this. Um, so firstly, I'm just going to start with asking you um, about net zero. So it's been said that a net zero future won't happen without significant investment in CCS. Um, what are your thoughts around this? Do you want to start? Yes, please. I'm fine. Um, I, I, I would agree with that statement. Um, I think... Uh, that CCS um, has a part to play in uh, in global decarbonisation. Um, it's not the be all and the end all solution. I think there's uh, it's going to be a combination of of solutions. But ultimately, CCS is really about putting the carbon that you took out of the ground back in the ground um, after you've extracted the energy from it, and that just makes a bit of logical sense to me. Um, but as I said, it's not the only solution. It's going to be just part of that mix. Um, but it's a very, it's a, it's a very important part, and it's also a uh, a way of accelerating uh, the decarbonisation process. Yeah, James, you said it perfectly. I fully agree. CCS is going to be part of the solution, but it would also enable alternatives as well. Blue hydrogen is blue if we can capture CO two. So if we don't do anything with the CO two while we generate hydrogen, possibly then it won't be blue anymore. So it would enable alternatives to complete that spectrum of alternatives that we really need to consider. I mean, obviously, CCS projects are expensive as it stands right now. Um, it's energy intensive, no doubt. That's why we need to invest. That's why we need to consider alternative technologies. That's why we need to work on code and standards. And hopefully at some point soon, we are going to meet the target with the help of CCS, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And so in the UK, um, there's a focus on net zero industrial clusters with shared infrastructure. And do you think that these can set the UK up to lead the way in, in the developing CCS markets? Yeah, it looks, it, the UK, I think, is already leading the way in, in some ways in this, in this space. Um, certainly far more advanced than, than many other similar locations around the world. Um, you know, both Human and I have global roles and we see, um, see what other countries are doing in, in the decarbonisation space and in the um, uh, CCUS space. Uh, and certainly uh, the UK has a great opportunity here to really become world leaders and drive the, um, uh, drive the, the, the solutions uh, and, and, and actually export that as almost a skill set. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I absolutely believe that the UK has got a great role role to play in this space and uh, the idea of using hubs rather than individual standalone projects uh, also just makes sense. It's collaboration and that's what we need to accelerate. Yeah. yeah. 100% James, I think you said it perfectly again. Um, the current CCS projects that we are dealing with are mainly called vertical CCS projects. These are the ones that we are dealing with one emitter. The emitter is actually not far away from the storage site. We are dealing with one operator. Everything is closed size and the scale of the CCS project is small. We really need to scale up. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier on, the cost of CCS projects are high. So if you can share facilities, it would enable us, yeah. it would allow us to go larger sizes. It would allow us to collect CO2 from different emitters, multiple emitters. It would allow us to transport larger amount of CO2 longer distances and would allow us to store larger, larger quantities of CO2. So if the question is whether CCS hub projects or shared facilities or um, larger CCS project is part of the solution, in my point of view, this is the future. Otherwise, scaling up small CCS projects here and there, it's not going to be possible. The location of some of the emitters is actually not close to the storage site. So we have to rely on batch transport, 
and it won't be physically possible. By sharing sites, by sharing facilities, by reusing existing um, reservoirs, depleted reservoirs possibly, would allow us to share the cost of the CCS mm -hmm. projects with multiple stakeholders. So that means the cost per stakeholder is less. But that's not just about the cost, but also the legal aspect, the commercial aspect, the responsibilities. The investors who are going to be part of this year are going to be more interested. So in my point of view, 100% CCS hub projects are going to play a major role. If you look at the latest IEA report, there are 15 large CCS hub projects across the globe under different development stages. Out of those 15, more than half are based in Europe. And if you look at track one and track two CCS project announced that the UK government is supporting, they are all part of that CCS hub based solution. So I would say UK in large scale would play a major role in long term, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Just to, I guess to add a little bit to that, the, the, let's, let's be honest, CO2 is rubbish. Yep, it's, 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 a, it's a waste product, it's trash, right? Uh, and if you think about it like that, you don't, everybody doesn't take their own trash to the, to the waste facility for a home. It gets collected by the councils uh, as a group because that makes sense. It reduces the energy requirements, the cost uh, associated. And, and CO2 is exactly the same. Yeah, it'll, it'll have, everybody's got different stuff in their rubbish bins and the rubbish, the rubbish trucks need to be able to cope with, with that. CCS is exactly the same thing. And so, so if you think about it like that and you think about it a little bit differently to perhaps hydrocarbons and think about it as a, as a waste product and we're trying to deal with a waste product, that's, uh, th th that then it just makes sense to have hubs. It doesn't make sense to have individuals stand alone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You, mean, you mentioned there about the use of um, depleted reservoirs. Um, how big an opportunity is that um, for the UK, do you think? Fantastic. Great question. So if you look at the existing operational CCS projects, they are mainly focused on CO2 injection in water aquifers. CO2 injection in depleted reservoir is something that we are trying to invest in. Obviously, it comes with its own challenges. I think no doubt every solution, any alternative solution comes with a challenge. But in the UK, we are very lucky in the North Sea we have been surrounded with reservoirs that we've been producing from. So we have lots of information about the reservoir. We have information about the characteristics of the storage site. Mm. So that would allow us to know the risk associated with CO2 injection in those reservoirs. Obviously, it comes with a, cha with a challenge. Legacy wells, they could potentially introduce the highest risk in terms of CO2 leak path. So risk assessment of existing facilities, existing storage site, depleted reservoirs is of interest. But the good thing is that in the UK, we have so many of these pockets of storage capacities with lots of knowledge about. And they are actually, some of them are very close to the larger industrial sites where if you can collect CO2, we can actually transport and store it safely in one of those locations. Uh, obviously it needs to be monitored, it needs to be controlled. So it, it, it opens so many opportunities for us and reduce risks associated with such opportunities, in my point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything to add on that, James? Uh, look, no, I, I, I'm not a reservoir engineer. I, 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 I do understand some of the challenges associated with the uh, use of depleted reservoirs over, uh, over aquifer storage. But, but I think Human touched on a really important point there. And the, the fact that, that you have a lot of knowledge about those reservoirs already is a huge huge advantage um, because one of the biggest unknowns in any CCUS project is the reservoir. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and if you, if you're using a reservoir that's already been well, uh, I guess, um, uh, studied and well analyzed and well understood, uh, then, then that, that reduces that risk and reduces the, one of the unknowns in that, in that equation. And investment. Yeah. And investment. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. you've already got the models, you've already got all of the uh, you, you've already got the wells there, the 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 and and all the infrastructure associated with it, which is a huge cost as well. Yeah, absolutely, just makes sense, right? Yeah. Um. So we know there's some significant challenges when it comes to capturing and transporting CO2 from a cluster of different emitters. Can you tell us about these and and how we overcome these to to ensure the UK is at the front of of CCS? This is humans. <laughs> this is human specialities. Yeah. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I mean, 
if we know that CCS hub-based projects is the future, we have to account for the risk associated with it. And the risk is that we are going to approach multiple emitters with multiple different CO2 sources that need to apply different capture technologies to purify it to meet a certain specification. The current CCS project, like in North America, for example, the majority of the CCS CO2 source is coming from natural resources. So it doesn't contain so many of the components that we are interested in, the contaminants. In the future, we are going to refer to hydrogen production units, cement unit, fertilizers, um, power stations. So it's an amalgamation of CO2 coming from different sources, sources with tiny quantities of those active chemicals and con contaminants. Problem is that when we transport and when we mix them together, it becomes a problem because they react together. It can create a corrosive phase within the transport storage part, but also it can have a significant impact on the integrity of the reservoir itself. It was not a problem before because we were collecting CO2 from one source and we were not dealing with all these nasty components, but now it is a problem now because we are collecting CO2 from multiple sources and we allow them to mix together. So it's a new problem that we have to deal with. There are gaps in the knowledge in terms of material testing. There are gaps in the knowledge in terms of modeling capabilities, risk associated with corrosion, fluid specification, maximum tolerance level, measurement, analysis, control philosophy. If you look at the statistical data in terms of the, the, the main reason for the incidence in the existing CO2 pipelines, the larger contributor for CO2 release and accident is actually malfunctioning of equipment, malfunctioning of control philosophy and wrong material selection. Mm. So you can see that these major challenges are going to be more pronounced in the future CCS hubs. So obviously there are things that we have to do and we have to be quick because we are going ahead with the projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think uh, Herman's touched on a, on, a, on a whole pile of really important points here. We could deep dive into this uh, enormously. The technical challenges uh, of um, CCUS hubs and, and the technical challenges of specifications and the impact on thermodynamics and corrosion are just, it's, it's huge. So there, there's PhDs worth of work there. But for me, one of the biggest challenges is actually um, uh, the way in which we need to approach these projects differently and the way in which we resource them with people. And the the C CO2 sequestration projects are a systems project. And that differs from the way in which we've traditionally done oil and gas. So oil and gas, traditionally, you would have a reservoir team that would create a boundary condition at a reservoir at the, at the sand face. And then you would have a, a, a DNC team, with, which would do the well. And then you'd have a sub C team, which would do the pipelines. And then you have a riser team, which would do the risers and a top sides team, etc. right? Each individual kind of boundary condition and they would uh, design their, their, the operations and design the equipment within their, within their boundary limits. Yep. Uh, and you could very easily specify those conditions and specify those boundary limits and etc. This With CO2, however, there is a fundamental difference. With CO2, we need to consider this as a system problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. We need to manage the entire system, which means we need to manage the compressors need to be designed to cope with the reservoir and to cope with the transport of the fluids in the pipelines in whatever phase it is that, that those fluids, et cetera, are transported in. Uh, and it just requires a different type of engineer that actually can understand the whole system, not just the individual components, but what those individual components uh, impact is on other components. It's a traditional thing that, that many flow assurance engineers have done uh, as interface discipline engineers, uh, but I prefer to call it systems engineering. And, and that is actually a huge challenge for the CO2. Extremely important. Yeah. yeah. Extremely yeah. important. Otherwise, it will never work. Yeah. 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 So you really need to know a team, a group of people who focus on different elements of the chain because they the interface between different elements of the chain is going to be the major important factor to make the whole thing work. So as James mentioned, system interface engineers or specialists are extremely important for the success of this. Absolutely. And do you think that we can overcome these challenges to, to make it a success? Yes, we can. Absolutely. I, I, I Again, resourcing and, and, and human resources are, the, are one of the biggest challenges. Um, 
uh, training and reskilling um, uh, existing uh, people. Every day is a new day. Everybody's learning with CO two every single yeah. day, uh, and so so uh, it's it's that's for me the, the 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 biggest challenge. But yes, I do believe we can overcome it. Uh, we are hiring like crazy at the moment. Uh, we are hiring a lot of graduates and 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 bringing them on board and training them up because this is a a huge field for the future. Um, uh, so I am co- confident that we can we can do it. Um, but uh, but yeah. Oh, no, do you want to? But Lisa, you asked previously about the role that UK can play. In the UK, we have significant experience in oil and gas. There are several skill sets that you can easily repurpose in decarbonization space, hydrogen space, COCCS space, alternatives. And I think we are really lucky in that point of view. James is absolutely right. We don't have enough resources to make it happen. But if we invest in training our own people, repurposing technology and skill sets that we have in this new market, then we are ahead of the game. And I think we are really lucky in that point of view in the UK, like in Aberdeen. I think we have the wealth of knowledge in oil and gas and that would make a massive difference. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I guess just to finish off that point, the, the risk of not getting the right people and not the people with the wrong, wrong yeah. training uh, is actually quite significant to the yes. projects. So... Um, CO2 is such a different fluid and it's such a different, uh, has such a myriad of different issues that we don't normally see. It's su- we transport it super critical a lot of the time. Uh, it, its phase behavior is a, it's called a narrow boiling point fluid, which means it changes very rapidly between different phases. Um, these things are tra- not traditional things which even oil and gas or, or process engineers would, would typically deal with. And if you get it wrong, you could be designing your system completely incorrectly, or you could end up with a system which is, uh, you know, it's, it's in an integrity, uh, has integrity issues, etc. And so having those resources which are trained correctly is a key focus for us um, and, 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 and providing those, those, those technical solutions which, which give the clients confidence that their system's being designed correctly. That is, that is really, really important. Just to give you an example, James has the largest flow assurance team in the world, which is focused on energy transition. And these people, as it, as it went, have been trained to do such studies with their background in oil and gas. And I think it makes a massive difference, one other person. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank you both. I'm just going to move on to our closing questions. So the theme of Offshore Europe um, for this year is accelerating the transition to a better energy future. What does that mean to you? Well, I'm a, I have a background in physics, uh, and so so whenever I hear ex- acceleration is a rate of change of something, yeah, and um, uh, there's Newton's equation of of motion is force is equals mass times acceleration, which otherwise uh, says that acceleration requires an outside force. It requires a change. It re- requires something to move it forward. For us to decarbonize and to be able to meet the energy demands of uh, of Europe and, in fact, of the world in general, um, we need to accelerate this change, yeah? uh, which means we need to actively force it. We, need to ha- we, we, need, we, we can't just sit there and wait, wait for it to change. It needs to, there needs to be an outside influence to force it, force it to change. Um, uh, and so that requires movement by governments. It requires movement by... Um, uh, uh, operators, and it also requires movement by engineering companies like ourselves to to take steps to retrain our uh, our employees to be able to deliver that change. That's actually a force. We, we, we're we're act- actually actively making a difference and 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 um, uh, trying to uh, to 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 push ourselves in that direction to accelerate in that direction. So for me, I think it's uh, it's um, it's absolutely essential because there's no way that the status quo and the business as usual is going to get us where we need to be for energy security for everybody in the world and um, in the future. James, you said it perfectly. James talked about legal aspect. He talked about investment. He talked about R&D, retraining people. I would like to touch base on one other aspect to it. And in my point of view, that's the digital applications. Without using the digital application, physics-based, data-driven, we will will never be able to achieve the net zero target in my point of view. That would allow you, that would allow us as an industry to accelerate the speed, 
to optimize the operation, to make the whole process much more efficient. Energy efficiency, as I mentioned earlier on, is one of the bottlenecks of CCS projects based on the current technology that we use. So using the advanced technology to make the process more cost effective, safer is, is key. I know that's not a topic of conversation for now, and that's basically my role within the organization. So I'm responsible for digital solution and technology for decarbonization. And that's beyond CCS. That's hydrogen, that's alternative, fuel switching, flare reduction, anything. Decarbonization is much larger than CCS. And we believe at Wood that without digital application and use of right digital solutions, we would never be able to fast enough to meet the target. That's the only thing that I wanted to add to what James mentioned. And you'll have heard it mentioned many times that the, one of the biggest challenges is resourcing. And, and as I said, I've mentioned it a couple of times, human resourcing, finding the right people. Yeah? Um, one of the things that helps us address that, though, is the digital technology. 100%. Digital technologies help us, uh, you know, taking advantage of, of movements in artificial intelligence, taking advantage of movements in physics-based modeling, etc. They help us address those human resource shortage issues um, to be able to accelerate that change, and it's a, it's 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 an absolutely critical part of the uh, part of that acceleration, and that's why we are investing quite a lot in that at Wood. So basically, we have dedicated team for decarbonization, we have dedicated teams for digital solutions, and we are trying to merge them together because they complement each other. Yeah, no doubt, yeah. and they both play a major role. If you just focus on the domain expertise in CCS or domain expertise in digital. And if they don't talk to each other and if they don't help each other, we would never, we, be, we would miss the target. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, thank you both so much for joining us today. And um, that's been Lisa. some really, really rich insights on, on the topic of, you, of CCS. And um, so, yeah, that brings our um, podcast on net zero industrial clusters to a close. Um, Thank you so much, Human and James, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.